Parliament, Samuel Okujatua Blackwa rejects internal inquiry by the Education Ministry into the case of alleged distribution of expired rice to senior high schools as he demands an independent probe. Meanwhile, the NDC flag bearer John Mahama has waded into the saga. We have details for you on campaign trail here on your election command centre with some 23 days to election day, December 7. We give the countdown on and also bring you campaign trail and give you updates as well on what is happening. We have some more reactions to the Supreme Court ruling as the details was provided by the Supreme Court in a 109-page document yesterday. We have details of that for you here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7 and the latest in business and sports. For now, though, let's start off for the summary of the news. Safa Boy and ACM. Thank you, Alfred, and welcome to the new summary segment. Let's set off for the details now. And to our first story, Ghana has recorded 658 fire outbreaks from January to October 2024, up from 569 in 2023, raising safety concerns. Chief Fire Officer Julius Kuno blames human negligence for most incidents. A major fire at Circle in Accra yesterday destroyed hundreds of structures, displacing residents and causing severe damage. The Ghana National Fire Service faces criticism over slow response times outdated um, equipment and inadequate resources prompting calls for better fire safety measures nationwide and the supreme court has ruled speaker alban bagwin's move to declare four seats vacant unconstitutional stating an mp seat can only be vacated if they switch parties during the current parliament kwame jantua of the cpp has urged the speaker to recall parliament immediately to pass key bills including the 2025 handover budget he also called on ndc mps to return to their minor Minority role in advising PPNPs to avoid provoking tensions by celebrating the ruling. This decision resolves the recent parliamentary impasse, allowing legislative work to resume. Also, the Electoral Commission is currently meeting with the Election Security Task Force at its headquarters to strategize for the upcoming December 7 general elections. And the task force, which includes security chiefs from various services, regularly convenes to ensure a safe and secure election process. The meeting comes off just 23 days before the elections and coincides with the ongoing transportation of ballot papers from the printing houses to the designated regions. And also, not Tong MP Samuel Okujito Ablakwa is demanding an independent investigation into claims that expired rice has been distributed to some senior high schools. The lawmaker alleges that 22,000 bags of rice which expired in December 2023 were repackaged where we package a bigger pardon in sacks labeled ECOWAS and made in Ghana rice without expiry dates. He is calling for urgent action to address the issue. And on to our last story, the National Labor Commission NLC has summoned striking teachers and educational workers union TEU to a meeting on November 20, 2024. This follows TEU's notice of an indefinite strike effective Monday, November 18, 2024, over the prolonged delay in concluding, signing and implementing conditions of service for Ghana education service, GES, Ghana Museums and Monuments Board and Public Technical and University Centers brings us to the end of our new summary segment and over to you, Alfred and Grace. Thank you, Safwa, for bringing us those updates. Let's get right into the bulletin now and begin from Boko because violent attacks continue to break out in Boko in the Upper East region with at least three more people killed this week and houses torched in the suburb of Daduri. Security sources have confirmed the killings are related to the long-standing chieftain conflict in the town which resurged last month following the entry of the rival chiefs in the town. Our correspondent Castro Senyala continues to monitor the situation in Baku and joins us now with more detail. Castro, bring us up to speed on the security situation in Baku right now. Right now, Baku is uh, a bit tense uh, right from yesterday all through to uh, this evening. It is very tense with increased security patrols. We understand that Yesterday, there were some clashes between the two factions uh, as to what ha I mean, caused it. I mean, yesterday's attack, our uh, clash, we are unable to uh, tell because security agencies aren't giving any further details aside from uh, what we are getting. We understand that uh, not less than three persons have been killed and several houses torched. We are still digging deeper. But as I speak now, uh, security agencies have, I mean, doubled up their efforts as far as uh, operation. 
and, and patrols to uh, Dandu, Sabongari, and all the other AP centers in the conflict uh, is concerned. And let me sort of remind listeners that uh, this is as a result, I mean, the bigger picture, I mean, the bigger problem uh, is as a result of the entry into Boku uh, by a rival chief. Mm. And uh, since uh, last month, triggered the conflict, I mean, sorry, the, the attack, and from time to time, uh, some of these things are witnessed. Uh, the concern uh, I am getting from residents who we usually would speak to on the phone when some of these things come is that uh, the security agencies, as the police continue to call, should increase patrols, especially the highways and uh, the epicenters such as Sabongari, Danduri, and other areas where the fighting is usually very intense and deadly. Kasha, so we know that the area is still under curfew. Update us on how this happened and how. It, all of that is happening even in the face of a curfew. Yes, so that is what uh, people continue to, to wonder. Mm. Uh, there's a curfew, but then we still get to hear that or, or we wake up to attack uh, in the night. And so uh, it's a question that lingers in the minds of everyone as to how uh, the attackers visually uh, sneak into, um, I mean, the vicinities of, I mean, others is something that the security agencies uh, say they are continuously working around the coast to see if they can see a lot of this. I, I have some in the security who tell me that it appears the situation uh, has become worse as, I mean, than ever before. And so sometimes the security agencies are overwhelmed. They are responding to uh, a, a, I mean, a, an attack in this suburb. And before then, uh, before they realize another attack is happening somewhere. And it appears that, I mean, uh, those involved in the, 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 I mean, all of this fighting, Take very note, I mean, good note of the movement of the security agencies because in the first place they are fewer and then they perpetrate these attacks. But then, whatever the issues are, the security agencies, are, I mean, that the police and the military uh, say they, continue, they are continuing to do what they have to do as far as ensuring that Boku is peaceful and residents and other indigenous there are, are, are safe. Kasho, does that mean that they have not been able to make any arrest yet? No, not arrests mm. have been made, and in fact, it appears uh, one of the ways the security agencies want to, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, douse down the tension ever since the conflict broke out in 2020 uh, was that arrests shouldn't be made. Not that they, it's openly stated, but it appears they don't want to usually make arrests that would trigger further attacks. Usually, what happens is that uh, the security try to ward off these attackers. And then if they are able to uh, get close to them, they mm -hmm. arm them, take those arms, and I mean, in terms of bullets and guns, and then uh, they ward them off so that the attacks don't continue. But as to arresting attackers, uh, it's been a long time uh, such, I mean, arrest, arrests have been made. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard anything like that. And usually when they ask the police or the, I mean, the, the military, they tell you they haven't made arrests. And before they responded to, I mean, go to the scene of the attack, these, I mean, perpetrators would usually get away so quickly. Mm. Kasho, how is this impacting on socioeconomic activities in the area? We know some banks and financial institutions serve notice of folding up. Some schools have also closed. In fact, the women in the area the last time held a demonstration to lament how they are even losing their livelihoods because of this. How is all of this coming together to impact socioeconomic activities in the area? The conflict is greatly impacting, negatively impacting socio-economic activities. Uh, if you take today, for instance, uh, I mean, brisk business activities within the town, I mean, died completely because no one uh, stepped out except those who uh, have shops close to their houses who would usually come out to open and then later on when it's hot, they run back into their houses. But in the main market where, I mean, brisk business takes place, Usually, when there's an attack, an overnight attack, I mean, the next morning and running into a, a larger part of the day, uh, the town is usually dead and quiet because people are, I mean, scared to move out, especially women, market women and children who are mostly, I mean, at the receiving end of this conflict. The schools, I mean, would usually close or temporary, they wouldn't, I mean, the academic activities wouldn't run out, would have been on a quiet, peaceful day. Uh, workers aren't able to go to work. And generally, there's usually a distortion of, I mean, activities of the town for a moment whenever these attacks are recorded. And the call has been that some of these things should stop. 
especially as we move to, if we move into an election year, I mean, an election, a major election in December next month, the cause of in that uh, some of these things should stop. The state agencies should have their game to be able to, co I mean, contain the spread and the deterioration of the conflict so that people can move back to their lives and make uh, something for themselves as, as far as, uh, I mean, their livelihoods are concerned. All right, Kashu, thank you for bringing us those details. And you should also take care of yourself, even as you go about getting us the latest on this story. It looks like the area is not safe for, for anyone. Kashu Senyala Aman in the Savannah region updating us on that escalated, prolonged local conflict. The latest is that three more persons have died with some other houses torched. Adon. Very sad development there, is it not? But yes, uh, uh, away from that, the North Tongue Member of Parliament, Samuel Okujato Blackwa, is demanding an in immediate independent investigation into allegations of the distribution and consumption of some expired rice in some senior high schools in the country. A lawmaker claims the rice amounting to about 22,000 bags, which expired in December 2023, was placed in locally produced sacks labeled ECOWAS and made in Ghana rice but with no expiry date. The Ministry of Education says it has commenced investigations into the claims, working closely with the National Food Buffer Company and the Ghana Commodities Exchange, the entities responsible for food supplies to senior high schools across the country. Member of Parliament argues the Education Ministry cannot investigate itself and is calling for a commission of inquiry into the matter. We spoke to him earlier today. I am disappointed that the Ministry of Education is feigning ignorance and trying to pretend that it only got to know about this when I put out this expose. I have intercepted an investigative report by the Food and Drugs Authority. As far back as January, a Deputy Minister of Education, Reverend John Intim for you, was briefed about this matter. As far back as January, the Ministry of Education could have stopped this distribution of expired contaminated rice, which had been rebacked without expiry dates, and which all our SHS students have been fed on. They could have stopped this as far back in January. So the attempt to now, in November, after this has been brought to light, after they have been exposed, create the impression that they only now got to know about it and are now going to investigate. Is this ingenious? Is this honest? is deceptive and it should not be tolerated. I must add that based on what I know and this attempt to feign ignorance by the Ministry of Education, what we need, what this country urgently needs, is an independent, impartial, credible investigation, not one that will be conducted by a ministry that is complicit. So the Ministry of Education itself has questions to answer. Why did the Deputy Minister for Education Reverend John and Tim Fogio unseal this information and did not take steps to stop the rebagging of this rice by the food and buffer stock company, which is an institution that works closely with the Ministry of Education. So they are all complicit in this matter. Mm. And we cannot trust any investigation that this ministry, which is complicit, will conduct. Mm. We need an independent, credible, impartial investigation by another entity. Not I see. the Ministry of Education. A commission of inquiry mm. will, 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 will be more credible. A commission of inquiry. Unfortunately, my checks from the schools, I have the, the entire distribution list. Unfortunately, all the rice has been consumed. From Presec to St. Monica's to Borga Girls to Konongo uh, Odumasi Senior High School, uh, Achimota, Laboni, Accra girls, they have all consumed this rice, over 22,000 bags. It's all finished. It's in the stomach of our children, uh, and our children have been put at great risk. The doctors who have assessed the FDA examination results say that this is contaminated food which will have been destroyed. Mm. It shouldn't even be fed to animals. So mm. this is a grave matter, and heads should be rolling. People mm. should be fired. People should be in jail. The, the, the guys at La Mers, Africa Investment Limited, and the food, uh, the, the food and buffer stock company, the CEO, uh, Abdul Wahab, the board chair, Nanabi, and others, should be facing the music. They should be losing their jobs. They should be sanctioned. People should be prosecuted. I don't understand mm. why 
the directors of laments were only given a slap on the wrist made to pay fifty thousand cities and they are walking freely smiling all the way to the bank they have made hundreds of millions at our expense at the expense of the the health of our SHS students people uh, should be prosecuted people should be in jail by now people should lose their jobs this is a grave matter i see and this uh, is Arabo. not a time for anybody to be feigning ignorance Samuel Okuja to black with them. And, and, and in fact, this is a matter that has generated a lot of concern, especially amongst parents um, who are listening to us right now. And some of the schools mentioned there that, per the information, the, this con uh, suspected contaminated rice have been consumed already. Now, uh, Kofi Asari is a director of Africa Education Watch, one of the foremost education CSOs we have on the continent. is joining us on the telephone right now. Mr. Asari, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Hot Edition. Hi, good evening and good evening to your audience. I mean, you've been following this case as well after the you know some of the could have talked black brought, brought it up and then if, even before that from what i from what, what i gather how concerning is this to the extent that what some of the could have talked black is saying is that these schools that received this suspected expired contaminated rice have already consumed the rice as we speak yeah it's, it's um it's concerning everyone should be concerned about the quality of food that we serve in our schools um this this issue i mean emerged the last quarter of last year so it is it is, it is not um news as i should put it um one would have expected that by now the news should be what the ministry of education fda the first talk have been able to put in place since then to ensure that standards in our food warehouses security systems um, and, and um, compliance issues are upheld, you know. Um, that's what we want to hear. Because at the end of the day, when this is happening, we want to see systems being strengthened to ensure quality assurance and foster the occurrence of the situation. So that is the update that I think the general public deserves from the Ministry of Education and not um, um, an indication that an investigation is about to be conducted into it. I'm not sure the PRO um, was around last year, last quarter, but this, this is not news. So one will expect the ministry rather to give us an indication of what so far has been done, especially within the context of the recommendations of the FDA preliminary um, report on the matter. So that sprint will be assured that um, something happened which wasn't consistent with the best practices. And then the, the proper forum, which is the FDA, investigated the issue and pronounced, sanctioned the, the, the culprits, and then um, ensured that all actors within the food value chain, you know, um, took certain key decisions and are implementing them. That is what we want to hear. I see. But then even beyond this, so it's a, a crucial point you make about what the education ministry must be saying now. The point you make is that it will be it will be factually inaccurate and disingenuous for them to, to feign ignorance of this matter because this is not the first time this is coming up. From what well, you do I know. I am surprised. I am surprised that the PRO it's not the ministry, so I won't say the ministry. I think the PRO was called on the phone when he was driving or so. The PRO. So I'm surprised that the PRO of the ministry is not aware of this, and they only got wind of this issue, and is promising that the ministry will investigate. But I'm sure if the PRO speaks to the the the, I mean, the minister, his deputies, those in charge of free senior high school, and I'm sure he will get a briefing that will that will I mean give him the indication that this is not a new issue. So about a year, last year, last quarter, that's when this issue happened. And so, um, and if he talks to the free national secretariat, I know he doesn't work in that secretariat, but if he talks to Buffer Stock, he will get to know that this is not an issue and that it has already been investigated. Okay, and that the focus of the ministry should rather be um, in enforcing the recommendations of the in in investigative body, which is the lawful authority. I'm told sanctions were, you know, meted out to um, laments. Uh, that is what the public 
Health Act says. Um, MDA has a mandate to slap fines ranging from a thousand penalty units to up to 14 years or so imprisonment. So depending on the gravity of the offense, I believe MDA has acted. I think that if the Honorable uh, MP uh, Blackwa um, has any reason to suspect that the investigations were not properly done, he can, peti- he can, he can petition Parliament to undertake an investigation because he's a member of Parliament. Uh, but if an investigation has already been conducted, as we are told, uh, I don't think it will be it will serve any useful purpose for the Ministry of Education to to, to reinvestigate the matter again. I think that it will have to be an oversight agency rather, and Parliament will be the best forum um, to review this particular issue that has already been investigated by the MP. That if the need arises, I mean the, the MP can petition Parliament. But I think that. Um, we must be briefed on the measures that have been put in place since then to forestall the occurrence um, of what's happened. And having said that, I also want to draw attention to the fact that in May of this year, FDA went to some schools, including Zwarungu City High School, and seized food items that had all expired, including the food, um, the free City High School masks, etc. So it is not, this is not, you know, um, it is not. The first time we are hearing this, we, I mean, uh, it, this is news that occasionally comes up. And I want to call for a much more stronger collaboration between the FD, the first off, and then the GAS and the Ministry of Education. It is when these four bodies work together that um, issues relating to unwholesome food, quality assurances in the warehouses, especially of the first talk, and then in the warehouses of schools, you know, are, are inspected. You know, to give parents assurance that the quality of food in, in our schools or being shipped from the warehouses to our schools are fit for human consumption. So with a much more closer, closer collaboration between the FDA and the Ministry of Education, GES, and the first talk um, will be required. And we expect Parliament to play a strong oversight in ensuring that this happens. To the extent that there's already an investigation that has been conducted into this, I mean, by the FDA, First off, no need for any any investigation by the Ministry of Education. Parliament could probably get into it with a probe. But then again, we have to get an update as to... Yeah, I also what, what think that, you know, um, Media General, for instance, as a media house, mm-hmm. can put in an RTR request and ask FDA right. um, it's, uh, about its report. Because the report that we are seeing out is a preliminary report. There might be a substantive report because the issue of fine, fi- the finding of lament is not in the final report. And so it would be great to engage the FDA and find out if there's a final report so that they can make it available so citizens can also um, advocate the implementation of the recommendations of that report. Kofi, I do appreciate your time. Thank I do you. appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Kofi Asari, Executive Director of Africa Education Watch, um, on this. And, and Grace, you're now getting to know that uh, there's already an investigation has been conducted by the FDA, in fact, confirming that indeed something of a sort happened, that the, the, the food, this, this rice was having some quality assurance issues. But then the other leg of it is the distribution of this rice to these these students who have already consumed them as, as we speak. And that's concerning. Now, there's a call for Parliament to institute a probe into this as well. Confident, he she, says these are 22,000 bags of rice. I mean, if you listen to the number of schools that Okujo uh, yeah. Tua mentioned, mentions Prosec, Accra Girls, St. Monica's. He didn't mention Accra Academy, but I'm sure they had some. That's <laughs> why the National Master and Science Peace really do well. But I mean, but anyway, but it's, 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 it's a serious matter. It is. Uh, it is very serious. Honestly, and this is one that we are keeping an eye on. Uh, some of the Tua Blakwa um, is going to be connecting with us in our subsequent bulletins on this matter because what we are learning as well is that it is 
according to Kofi Asari, disingenuous for the education ministry to feign ignorance of this mm. because they were part of the investigation by the Food and Drugs Authority, Authority into this particular issue. So then, why would the ministry now be saying they're going to conduct investigations into it? Investigate that's, themselves. That's, that's the issue now. And John Mahama has also went into this matter. He's been talking about it, justifying the reason why if he wins uh, the December 7th presidential election, he would take away that function of the distribution of the food to the senior high school students. And let the schools do the purchasing themselves. Absolutely. That has been a call by Chas for some time now. They want to buy the food themselves. Let's hear from Joe yeah. Mahama. Mm. <laughs> Expiry date, a wasso, a chub, na MPP are buying national buffer stock, omo de sa and mono, omo per se, obiabe who expiry date, ninety, se and mona say, omo de bottle for fro, no moshe and mona say no gum, and omo de acquire secondary schools, edama, young quadano, edi, and in a NDC say, ya ba. Yen koto and more embrace schools, no. Sika was said, Yadisha and Kodano and the free SHS, no. As I went so senior high, or Musika, Yadibaba, the man or more headmaster. No, I call as I went so jum, no, I caught up by re, or taught up Gary, or caught up a That's John Mahama there, and uh, this is Hot Edition. We'll keep an eye on this one, and we'll update you as we go on. Well, let's now go to the EC head office, because the Electoral Commission is meeting the election security tax force currently underway. The tax force, including security chiefs or the various security services, hold regular meetings to strategize for the upcoming general election. Tonight's meeting comes barely 23 days to December 7th general, as it also coincides with the current transportation of ballot papers from the printing houses to designated regions. On Thursday, the commission transported ballot for the greater Accra region to the central holding point in Accra to be distributed to the various constituencies. Earlier today, the commission dispatched the ballots for the central, savannah and western regions. Let's connect with my colleague Christian Yale, who is at the premises of this all-important meeting and joins us with more. Christian, what's today's meeting about and which representatives are currently there? All right, great. So what we know is that currently uh, the representatives of the various political parties are here. Uh, this is more or less like another emergency ITAC meeting that has been called. And so mm. I have cited the likes of Evans Nimako, Director of Elections for the New Patriotic Party, as well as uh, the Deputy Director of Elections for the NDC, Dr. Rashid Tamko, among a host of other political party representatives like those from the Movement for Change, uh, Nanaya Osapon is here, as well as other party uh, representatives. I've even cited someone, uh, um, the likes of um, uh, Asaki Awingobit, who are mm. all here. But what you also understand is that uh, there will be um, a host of other security um, officers who are going to be here. The initial understanding we got was that it was a meeting between the Electoral Commission and then the security forces, but it turns out to be that it would be another form of an IPAC meeting that has political parties also representing already. When we arrived earlier, we saw that the Electoral Commission Chair uh, and Jim Mensah was in a crunch meeting with uh, some designated uh, high-ranking officials, uh, which meeting was not um, uh, available to us to partake in. It was a closed-door meeting that she had with them. We, we don't know exactly what was discussed at that meeting, but we know that whatever be the fallout, that would be brought before the the general meeting with the political parties and the security officers, which we are currently even ready to witness because we've been allowed access into the meeting room for that meeting to start grace. And question from the political party reps, what do you glean, their demeanor and their conduct and all of that? Oh, it's, it's, it's so far been a very friendly one. Uh, they've all been chit-chatting. I can 
I can hear lots of uh, jokes being carried around uh, between all of these parties that who are here. Uh, you know that it is always the case. It is only when they come in the public forum that uh, everyone wants to share their dissenting opinions on issues. Um, we're just hoping that issues within drug today as it happened in the uh, very recent IPAC meetings that happened. But we know this becomes very crucial, be it an IPAC meeting or uh, security task force meeting. What is crucial is that we know the Electoral Commission has already started the distribution of uh, ballot papers nationwide with a major exercise that took place yesterday, which we brought all the updates to our listeners. But it, it brings to the fore the concern that, you know, the polls are very closer and closer than ever. And so uh, it becomes very important for some of these stakeholder engagement to be uh, to be held uh, mm-hmm. as regular as possible to to brief everyone to get everyone carried along you know that there have been concerns recently over the uh, certified uh, voter register and all yes. of that which uh, some of the parties have been raising concerns especially the opposition national democratic congress and so though all of those are some of the pocket of issues that have raising and even with the ballot papers being distributed with some raising concerns about the timing and whether the EC is able to uh, distribute all of them nationwide early enough looking at the period we have like roughly some three weeks ahead to mm. the elections and mm. so we we anticipate what the content and the agenda for this meeting is mm-hmm. going to be which yeah. will very soon start because the media has been allowed inside and we are all Set up and waiting for either the chairperson herself who is around or in, any of the deputies are cited. Uh, Mr. Samuel Tete, the deputy director in charge, uh, the deputy chairperson in charge of uh, operations around as well, among other top ranking EC officials and commissioners who are around. Either of them who addresses us will we have what the content and the agenda is going to be. And obviously, we know that the distribution of the ballot papers is good. And also, yeah. the uh, issue of the voter register is also going to come as up. As well as the closure of some polling stations, I'm sure that one might exactly. also come up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Exactly. So, Christian, thank you for those updates. We'll definitely come back to you when the meeting commences so you update us on what the discussion and conversation has been so far. My colleague, Christian Yale, updating us from the EC head office as the EC meets reps of the parties as well as other stakeholders when it comes to the December polls. Talking about stakeholders, the man at the helm of affairs at the Ghana Police Service, I mean the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Kufudampare, has assured of a peaceful election process during the upcoming December polls at a commission of two new police stations in the Eastern Region. He warned individuals or groups who may attempt to disrupt the peace will face swift action. Let's listen to him. So that was the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Ekufu Dampare. We apologize for the cuts. We'll bring you the full complement of that audio and what the IDP has been telling Ghanaians as well as the Ghana Police Service of the upper preparedness even as the election approaches. Certainly so, Grace. Now, away from that to some more stories. The National Labor Commission has summoned striking teachers and educational workers union, that's TEO, to a meeting on November 20, 2024. This follows TEO's notice of an indefinite strike effective Monday, November 18, over the prolonged delay in concluding signing and implementing conditions of service for the Ghana Education Service, the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, and the public technical and universities. A statement signed by a director in charge of administration and human resources at the National Labor Commission, Dr. Benis Welbeck, noted that the NLC is exercising its powers pursuant you on to Section 139 of the Labor Act 651, which directs parties to appear for hearing on the issues in dispute. The NLC Director Teo to thus stay the intended strike action. King James Azotiba is General Secretary of the Teachers and Educational Workers Union. He joins me on the telephone. King James, good evening. Good evening. 
Thank you for joining us. So here's what the NLC is saying. Stay your strike action. Don't go as yet because there is a meeting they want you to attend on November 20. Would you abide by that? Yeah, yeah, no abide. So essentially what this means is that you're not going on your strike November 18, Monday. It's not happening. Yeah, I just you are saying it. So I'm yet to get my office to see the letter that you are referring to. But uh, well, uh, this letter is not in dispute. So, assuming without admitting that you go and you see exactly what I've told you, that means that you are not going to go on the strike. And this is the only way. Yes. So the strike will not take effect on Monday. They are meeting there on Wednesday. But there are fundamental issues that you, reasons why you decided to go on this strike. And you have, this is not the first time the NLC sought to meet you on this. So really, what, what posture and expectation are you going into this meeting with? Exactly, so that's why we are waiting to wait. What are the specific issues on the table for you now? The specific issues on the table is the delay intentional delay on the concluding and signing of our condition of service for our members in the Ghana Education Service, the Missions and Monuments Board, the Ghana Library Authority, and the Ghana Technical University, and the Public University of Ghana. So these are major stakeholders of our union that the conditions have been over the past four years. Over the past four years? Yes. In the case of uh, the Ghana Education Service, the last time we need a condition of service was 2020. And on a wonderful Napoleon President was uh, the minister in time. And the uh, Labour Act mandates that we to renew this conditions of service every two years. Back and forth, back and forth, 2022 and up. We couldn't conclude. We have started again from 2023 up to 2024. And so the one where everyone designed sign it then will have to be from 2024 to 2026. And our members have lost a lot of benefits from due to those the layers on the conditions of service. In the case of the public universities, since 2019, we've even signed a memorandum of understanding. It was left with just our two items and back and forth, up to down. And so you can see what a Labour Commission is aware of this. And so we'll meet there on Monday and then we can move from there. I see. So for this past four years that you've been going, as you describe it, back and forth with the ministry, NLC, on this matter. What has been the reason why they've not been able to conclude on the, the negotiated benefits or the conditions of service? This is a million dollar question everywhere we are asking ourselves. Also, when our counterparts in the in the case of Ghana Education Service, the teachers union, they signed yes in June. And we send our proposal, they won't call us to sign it now. In the case of the public universities, the standard of the lecturers, we talk members in June. The standard of the senior staff and the senior members, and they are about two days ago. And why are they not calling us? We feel very slanted, we feel very discriminated, we feel they are not treating us, they are not taking us serious. And our members are not really happy about it. We cannot control them. <laughs> So uh, you say you say you cannot control your members. So in, in in the instance, even if the NLC says don't go on the strike and your members are not happy about it, then what next? Oh, we are citizens of this country, so we move from here. We meet there on Monday, uh, Wednesday. Uh, thank you, uh, King James. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.
and uh, we'll, we'll have a conversation on, on this matter and uh, be able to delve into it well. So we'll see. Um, in some 80 minutes so to the top of the hour, 6 p.m. here on Hot Edition on 3 FM 92.7. Also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. And on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. You hear um, King James who is the General Secretary of the Teachers and Educational Workers Union, Grace, talk about their consistent engagements with the National Labor Commission over the period. Spanning the last four years. Four years now, not much has been achieved after this. And so if the NLC is saying, okay, don't go on the strike on Monday, we'll meet you on Wednesday, then what's going to be different? Mm. That's the fundamental question on their minds right now. Let's we, 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 We're going to get through to the National Labor Commission in a bit. Ufoswa Samoa, who is the Executive Secretary of the NLC, hopefully gets through to us on the telephone. We'll speak to him on this. Alfred, while we do that, let's do some health stories because the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kumabwaje, says the COVID-19 pandemic presented a real test to the country's resilience promising the health experts will continue to remain focused. Speaking at an event to climax the 30th anniversary celebration of the School of Health at the University of Ghana, Dr. Kumabwaje called for deepened collaboration between the various actors in the sector. It was on the theme, three decades of public health education, research and service strengthening global health systems. As a Ghana Health Service, the school's critical role in strengthening our nation's health system has not been lost on us. Over the past three decades, the School of Public Health has been instrumental in training highly qualified personnel, conducting, conducting groundbreaking research, and offering expert advice to policy formulation on issues such as disease prevention, maternal, child health, environmental health, and more recently, pandemic preparedness including creating models for us on our interventions. Today, more than ever, we see the importance of building a resilient health workforce, one that is prepared to respond effectively to emerging health threats. This and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored this necessity. And I am proud to say that the University of Ghana School of Public Health has been at the forefront supporting our country's effort through research, public education, training, and even including conducting field work with us. Join Director of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kumar Abuaje, there, Dean of the University of the Ghana School of Public Health, Professor Kosi Tope, highlighted on some of the major milestones achieved by the school after three decades. And a lot of these people within the health sector are helping improve the quality of health care that is available to Ghanaians. They are solving a lot of the problems related to infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and then of course uh, disease outbreaks. In addition, the School of Public Health, the key highlight has been the research findings that we make and that drives the policy agenda for Ghana. So the school has made a number of contributions through research, through learning, through teaching, and I think we've made an integral part of the government's plan to provide quality health for its population. Director of the Ghana School of Health, Professor Kwesi Topi there. So, matters of health, spokesperson on the health committee for the 2024 John Mahama campaign. Governor uh, Minta Kando says the recent pledge by Dr. Mahmoud Obamian, the MPP presidential candidate, to provide free dialysis treatment for kidney patients is yet another empty reactionary promise from a government that has persistently failed to address the health care needs of Ghanaians. The MPP flag bearer this week announced free dialysis for kidney patients effective December 1. However, the job also member of parliament and ranking on the health committee of parliament says the promise has no credibility in terms of policy framework as there is no reference to it in the npp 2024 manifesto in a statement the mp also noted there is no allocation whatsoever in the 2024 national health insurance fund allocation formula neither is there any necessary budgetary support provision in 2024 budget prepared by the economic management team headed by Dr. Baumia. He says this commitment is a deceptive attempt to win public favor. 
in the lead up to the elections. Let's uh, hopefully get through to Kamramita Kando to have a quick conversation on this matter here on Hot Edition on 3 FM 92.7. This issue um, right now on, on this, but let, Grace, before we get into the issues of uh, the bushfires, Kamramita Kando is a job also member of parliament. Mm -hmm. He is a ranking on the health committee of this eight parliament. He's also uh, the spokesperson on, on the health sector committee for the 2024 John Mahama mm -hmm. campaign. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you. So, Kando, thank you for joining us. Hello, can I see? Yes, that's me. Okay. Good evening, my brother. It's good evening to you. Thank you so much for making the time to, to join us. So, this is the promise by Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. In fact, in the next two weeks, he says, persons on dialysis would enjoy free dialysis treatment f beginning December 1. Why do you say this is a deception? Let me say good evening to your listeners and say that it's unfortunate um, as for this time around, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia cannot get his way. I mean, the deception prior to 2016 election is long gone, and nobody will fall for these tricks and deceptions. Um, and I say so because um, uh, what Baumia is saying basically is that free diocese is going to start in, on the 1st of December. And we all know, they mentioned the National Health Insurance Formula and the main budget. We all know that we have passed the 20, um, 2024 budget. It was nowhere in the 2024 budget. Now, the 2024 National Health Insurance Formula also didn't contain what Dr. Baumia is talking about. So the first question is, where is it going to be funded for the source of funding this particular program? The source of funding. We are not going to sit down to be told that every district will get, or every constituency will get $1 million. Then at the end of the day, come and tell us stories. So clearly, we, he has not indicated where he is going to get the funding from. Two, if we are going to rule out a program in 1st December, Seven or six days later, there's going to be an election. And usually, the health facilities will pre-finance these programs before they are paid, just like the National Health Insurance. What it means is that if there's anything at all, it is the future government, it is the John Mohammed's government who is going to pay any bill of that nature. Three, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia had the opportunity to put forward his party's manifesto or his manifesto. What prevented him from stating in it? Because his essence, John Dramani Mahama, stated it in his manifesto as far back in 2020, prior to 2020 elections, and repeated the same in 2024 manifesto. So I think that um, it's just um, reactionary <laughs> to what his excellency John Dramani Mahama has stated that he is going to do vis a vis the Mahama case. You know, so um, he, I think they have assessed that policy or promise and have seen that it is very popular among Ghanaians. And therefore, he also has to come and repeat something of that. He doesn't actually mean it. Because we're in this country, when they sat aloof and saw not less than 19 people died when Kolebu was closed down, uh, the radar unit of Kolebu was closed down, why didn't he come out to respond? Why didn't he help? So I don't get where he's coming from. I see. Well, but so if this should take effect, December 1, it, it does come in just two weeks away from now. And then it is indeed the case that there's free dialysis for uh, persons you know, with kidney issues. Then what next? Because you have indicated clearly that with all of these sources approved by parliament, this is not captured in there. So what's going to happen next? What's actually going to happen is that, you see, what it means is that this is only going to happen within six days. Because immediately after first, seven, we are going to have an election. That's going to go into an election. So any policy of that nature will not be a policy for the incumbent government. Are you going to say that even if there's going to be any payment, they are going to pay for the six days or the one week or the two weeks? So any of such programs is going to be a future program. That's what it means. 
So is he talking about the future program or is he talking about the program that is going to start today? So you don't actually, I mean, so it is like, because he knows that people will ask him the question, that like why haven't you started? Because you are the incumbent government. So let me come out and say that I'm going to start it in, in December. Are we not going to go into an election in December? Are we not going to go into an election and we're going to change government? So any, any program of that nature will be for a future government. So it's clear deception. If it's for a future government, you should say so. If indeed that he, he thinks that President Mohammed's promise or policy is popular, and therefore he wants to, I mean, copy or plagiarize as they have been saying, he should say so. He's free to do that, but he must accurate the source. I kind of appreciate your time on this. Thank you so much. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Kovna Mita Kando is Member of Parliament for the Jaboso constituency. Is the ranking on the Health Committee of Parliament also leads the Health Committee of John Muhammad 2024 campaign. Grace, on the matter of bushfires, as we have it in here right now, before we go for this quick break, we'll settle for the business news, after which we'll come with the sports news and campaign trail as well. Between January and October 2024, Ghana recorded 658 fire outbreaks, up from six, up 569 during the same period in 2023. The most recent occurred on November 14, 2024, at Circle in Accra, where hundreds of structures were completely destroyed by fire. Speaking at the national launch of the 2024-2025 bushfire prevention campaign, Chief Fire Officer Julius Corner attributed the rise in the fires across the country to human negligence over the years. Ghana has faced several devastating fire outbreaks and this is coming in as no different and it's one that we'll keep an eye on after this quick break here on Hot Edition on 3 FM 92.7 also live on Kesme 107.1 in Tamale and beyond and on W93.5 in Y and beyond. We'll go for this quick break when we're back. Minua Fall is joining us with the latest in the world of business. Today, we thank you very much for your invaluable service to this great company, and we wish you well on your retirement. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Happy retirement, Lee. Thank you very much. So, are you staying or you are going back to Ghana? I'm going back home, of course. Wow. You really built? I've got a home at Lakeside Estate. Really? Cut, 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 cut. Lakeside Hills is a dream come true, a community designed for all stages of life. Whether you're a growing family needing more space, a young professional looking for convenience, or someone seeking a peaceful retirement, Lakeside Hills has it all. With two, three, and four bedroom homes, there's something for everyone. That's impressive. Exactly what I'm looking for. I have to start saving towards this. See you back home. Lakeside Hills, it's not just a place to live, it's a place to thrive. Parliamentary and presidential elections. Kofi Akpalu and Samna Tomi team here. Made a matter of manu. Labour Party of Ghana (LPG) presidential candidate is saying, "Oh, we need better president here. We need to make sure we see the idea. Now, by the time we cut, seven hundred Ghana cities. After that, we have budget five hundred Ghana cities. After ten billion US dollars." Job fund for young entrepreneurs. Now by 2028, now we are fixing Ghana. Kapenya. Omo, omo di infiel di moche. Eko ni infiel so. Koko ane mrewa. Ah, omo ni e juma no so. We pay them unemployment benefits. The other thing is, obi e juma. By anake chena o njano. It's nothing to write home about. Iti ebe man supplement. University education free. Free Wi-Fi for all schools and colleges. Affordable housing and rental accommodation. Galam se no small scale mine no so. Obesu cheni ye. Se da baya ensa Ghana sa. For industrial use, it is a work to a banua, December Savia, presidential box of one, Shabbatia for free Aqueluda, never mention Shagana. Three FM ninety two point seven, Urban Lifestyle Radio Station. Hello, 
good evening. Welcome to the business segment on Hot Edition. Coming up tonight, governments urge to support Ghanaians construct self-service to home biogas to curb rising cost of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, and sustain climate change fights. My name is Menu. I have full details of these and more. I'll line up for you. Please stay. Well, let's get straight to our first story. A sustainability activist and a senior lecturer at the University of Professional Studies Accra, Dr. Eric Bochi Adam, is sounding the alarm on the rising cost of liquefied petroleum gas in Ghana. He's urging government to take immediate action to address this issue, warning that if left unchecked, consumers may shift back to traditional, environmentally harmful energy sources, undermining efforts to promote green energy. Since July, there has been a the recent increase in LPG prices defeat government purpose and there's a need uh, uh, for government to address it. You know, in 2020, when LPG prices were around five cities, uh, around five cities generally, the, gen the, the total consumption was about 27.6 million. In 2022, the price per kilogram increased around 11 uh, uh, cities and the, the total consumption fell to about 25 million. So clearly there is a, a, a relationship between LPG prices and it uptake. And if government do not address the increase, there will be a return to the use of firewood, you know, which has a lot of impact on the users. And there are several factors that is driving uh, this uh, uh, upsurge in LPG prices. I do not think it's, it's taxes. Meanwhile, to mitigate this, the lecturer recommends that the government supports Ghanaians in constructing self-serviced home biogas systems to reduce the country's dependence on natural gas, which is becoming increasingly expensive globally. Since July, there has been an upward increase in the general uh, in the price of LPG on, on, on the global market, and this is informing uh, how these uh, commodities or LPG is priced in Ghana, and coupled with the cost of producing LPG in Ghana uh, going up, we expect this cost of production of LPG to continually reflect in, in, in the consumer prices as well. So the way forward, I think that government should, should find a way to, uh, to support household to construct their self-service uh, uh, home biogas. These models are tested in Fiji. Fiji, in Fiji, most households have their own uh, biogas system that produce the biogas that they use for their cooking needs. You know, this will re reduce the reliance on the national LPG. And generally, it will not force households to go back to the use of firewood. Senior lecturer at the University of Professional Studies Accra, Dr. Eric Boachi Yadom, there. Now, Acting Commissioner of the National Insurance Commission, Michael Kofiando, has hinted that Ghana's mortality table currently in development is expected to be ready by the first quarter of 2025. This table will provide essential data on the probability of death for each age group, showing the likelihood that a person will pass away before their next birthday. A crucial information for determining life insurance premiums. Currently, Ghana doesn't have a Ghanaian mortality table. So some actuaries use the South African table, others use the European table, others use the North American tables. But you see, these are not Ghanaian. Their demographics are different from ours, and their people are different from ours. And so sometimes they make adjustments to some of these tables and they apply them to Ghana. But the adjustment may not be as appropriate as it should be. For example, the HIV prevalence rate is not very high in Ghana, but some of them may make undue adjustment, increasing that rate so much for us. And so it is really important that we do have our own mortality table, which will speak to our unique and specific circumstances so that product can be appropriately priced and, and it will be for the Ghanaian population. 
Well, that over there was Acting Commissioner of the National Insurance Commission, Michael Kofi Ando. There. That's it for the business segment on Hot Edition. For more stories, kindly check out our website. It's www.3news.com. My name is Menu Afo. Stay tuned. Oreku Ampofo is on standby with the sports news. We're just about an hour away from kickoff uh, for the very big game between Ghana and then Angola. That match would be in Luanda. Kickoff should be around 7 p.m. And the good news that we have for you is that there will be commentary live here on 3FM 92.7. Very, very important day uh, for Otto Adu, who says that he's confident that the team can pick up a victory. Welcome to the sports here on Hot Edition with me, Ori Kwampofu. First off, let's hear from the head coach, Otuado, who's been speaking ahead of this big game and remains optimistic that the Black Stars can pick up their first win of the qualifiers. Difficult games and you can't take it for granted that they will play, let's say, 50% or so. And, um, I know that they will give 100%. It's going to be difficult. It's an away game. And it's going to be very, very tight, I know, but um, I think mentally the boys are ready, um, yeah, looking forward for that game, um, yeah, it's time for our first victory in this competition and uh, I think um, it's a great chance to, to keep the chance alive. Well, Tuado says that it's a good opportunity to keep um, keep their chances alive uh, for the Black Stars. Remember that uh, Ghana are still rooted bottom of Group F with two points. However, they were done a huge favour by Niger, who beat Sudan by four goals to nil. And so that's the reason why Ghana are still within their right of qualifying. Joining me in the studio is Emmanuel Andam and then Enoch Fifi Forsen. Uh, that would be your commentary team that you'll be hearing a lot more from in just under an hour. Uh, but let me start with you, Andam. Uh, what's your overview for tonight? What are you expecting from this game? I think it's a mass win for the Black Stars and most importantly, it will be a tough game. It's been made even more harder for us by the absentees we have in the team, knowing very well that Angola are not going to be pushovers for this one. So I'm expecting a tough game. Uh, if the boys play with the swagger of just going out there to play for pride, like you said last time, I think they can do it. But I'm, not, I'm trying to place a heavy lid on my expectations for this one. So I'll just say it'll be a close game. Well, Epson, for you, what Angola side do you expect? There's no African country that has won more games in 2024 than the Palangas Necras. And they've been really impressive. Four wins out of four. How much of a Herculean task is this for the Black Stars? Well, I, I still expect the Angolans to come into this game with, with, with more purpose. I, I, I listened to their coach and he said Ghana's qualification chances were just low to impossible, meaning they are not going to play soft as many of us are thinking. I feel Angola are going to come in strongly. They have a good record at home to protect. Remember, they ended Ghana's long unbeaten run at the Barbara Sports Stadium and they would like to they would like to win in front of their home fans to also 
so they are qualification. I think this is their last home game and it's been a brilliant campaign for them and topping it up with a win at home is will be just fantastic for them. So, so Ghana, we have to double our efforts because obviously we've not we've not been playing really well in the qualifiers. Four games, no wins. And we look at Otuado. Otuado, if if you listen to the the audio you feel okay, maybe he's confident by his poster. If you watch the video you could tell He's, he's, he's not really confident going into this game. He, he didn't, his poster in the video didn't sound encouraging at all. So I'm looking at it from a, an angle that Ghana are going to go in strongly and I expect Angola also to come in strongly to sell a, a very good match and a competitive game. I don't want to see any any like a Desca play from Angola. Although we know they've qualified, but I expect them to come in strongly to just win this for their fans and <laughs> so a very good campaign for them. <laughs> Well, there's no pressure on them, actually. Uh, they've been dancing in their camp. Uh, there's been a few vid- videos on social media. They seem very relaxed. And why won't you be when you see good qualification to the AFCON with two games to spare? Uh, Esten mentions that Ghana would have to do something that they haven't done in the qualifiers. That's to win a game. Four games so far, no wins. What do you think has been wrong? And what does Otto have to change today to ensure that they get three points? I think it's down to our goal scoring form. For the throughout the entire qualification process, we scored just a single goal, and we are struggling to find the back of the net. So I think if today the players can play with that bit of efficiency up front, and just go out there try and find the back of the net as much as possible, we've got the firepower to do that. Mohamed Kudus, Fatawi Saku, Jordan, Jordan Ayu up front, they have the potency to just cause harm. Should they click or gel in this particular game? We've seen Otaro tweak his team from time to time, but this particular game is calling for these three to lead the line, and we're hoping that they will do that for us. Well, as in, Otto won't have all of his tools, quite a number of absentees in the team. It would be a very difficult job for him, but do you still think that when you look at that squad, that 23-man squad, they have enough to be able to get a three points tonight? Uh, I think I've always said that quality for the Blaster has never been in question, and if you look at even with the mass withdrawal of the players, we still have quality in our ranks and we still have players who are enjoying some good football at their club side. Jordan Ayu has been scoring for Leicester City. Fatah Isaac is playing his best football since moving to Europe at Leicester City. We've seen Mohamed Kudus even before the red card he, he scored. So he's, he's, he's doing pretty well. There's Osman Bukhari coming in as one of the replacements. The firepower is always there and the quality has never been in doubt. It's just about the coach getting his, his tactics and everything spot on. And I think Ghana are going to go in strongly. I expect them to go in strongly because obviously what happened yesterday in the in the Niger game against against Sudan. Niger winning by four goals to one has revived Ghana's hopes of qualifying. So they need to win this game and also hope to win the, the last game against Niger. But still destiny is not in our hands as we've always said that. But so a draw today is, is a draw, I think a draw eliminates Ghana completely. Yeah, completely. Yeah, and a, a defeat also eliminates Ghana completely. So it's going to be very difficult. Otto has to get things right. And I mentioned about the goal scoring and unfortunately there's no, there's no Antoine Semenyon who I feel among our strikers is, 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 at, is at the peak of his powers at, at the moment. There's no Antoine, there's no Inaki, but still there's Jordan and there's Kudus. We expect Kudus to carry the team. Today is not going to be the cap- he's not going to be the captain of the side, but I feel he's going to wear the number ten, and the number ten comes with more responsibility also, and he has to carry the team. He has to play one of his best footballs this this year for Ghana. I think the last time we saw Kudus playing so well and carrying the team was against Egypt at the African Cup of Nations. That's that's almost ten months ago, and it's it's, it's been a long time. So we want to see that Mohamed Kudus that scored two goals against Egypt, Egypt today in Luanda. Well, I'm, let me come to you, Andam. Um, Otoado will probably be uh, getting ready to give his final speech before the boys head out in Luanda to play this very important game. Uh, what do you think will be running through his mind with regards to how he approaches this game? I think he will see it as a do-or-die situation, one which he knows that he has failed Ghanaians to an extent throughout the qualifiers. And you'll be hoping to make amends with these two remaining games. Like you said, Niger has given us that slight lifeline that we can just cling on to and hope that with the two wins, bearing results elsewhere, would go in our favour. The Black Stars haven't played well. I think Otoado of all people knows this. And if I was him in the dressing room, I would say to the boys, look, we have two more games. If we can treat these games as a final, it would do a lot more 
than you would expect because obviously Niger of all people getting a win over Sudan was unexpected. And this group, I, this group, I feel like there's a lot more twists and turns in this group come the last day of everything. So a win will do for the Black Stars. As an about the approach tonight, uh, if you are out to Ado, would you come out all guns blazing, looking to start well, impose yourself, dominate from the beginning and hopefully get an early goal? Or would you want to rather absorb the pressure and see what happens in the first half and rather go all out in the second half knowing that you would have to get three points? What would be the balance that you want to strike I think approaching this game? I think it's going to be the latter. And I, I feel he's going to approach the game like they did against Mali in Bamako. In the first half of that game, we saw the blaster sitting deep and trying to absorb the pressure and not not trying to concede a lot of goals and fortunately for Ghana we considered just one goal and in the second half we got his tactics and his substitutions right and Ghana managed to equalize and won that game I feel it's going to be a similar a similar thing and so when the blasters are not playing too well in the first half Ghanaians shouldn't panic this is this is, this is my opinion but I feel I feel he might also go with with a full attack going all guns blazing from the onset and trying to beat Angola because obviously Angola have already qualified and they might not come in as strongly as they might not come in strongly but I just feel if he goes with the approach of absorbing the pressure not getting scattered from the onset because Angola if Angola wants to play and they want to play really well they have they, they can they can rip us apart and the likes of Dala and all those boys are, are very good so we have to be very cautious we have to be very cautious the, well, lastly, predictions from you two. Excellent. <laughs> I feel Ghana will win by a single goal. 1-0, one 1-0? One one? Yeah. One yeah. Okay. Yeah, same for me. Same? Yeah. Okay. Well, these are the two gentlemen that you'll be hearing from in about 45 minutes' time live here on 3FM 92.7 when we bring you live commentary of the master win game between Angola and then Ghana. And so you do want to tune in. But in the meantime, Hot Edition continues right after this. Welcome back. This is Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Oreg Wampofu and the team just gone by with the latest from the world of sports. Ghana is playing Angola at 7 p.m. Stay with us for all the details as well as the live commentary and all of that. Time now for us to go to the Election Command Centre. And as you already know, we have begun a series here on 3FM on every Wednesday and Friday called Where to Watch. We bring you some of the constituencies you need to watch in this upcoming election. Today, we are throwing the spotlight on the Dom Kabinya constituency and why you need to watch out for this constituency. It's a cross-section of constituents in the Dom Kabinya constituency, known as a new patriotic party stronghold, are now expressing preference for the National Democratic Congress after what they say has been poor performance by the current government and their member of parliament. Here is Judith Brown's report when he visited the constituency. constituency since its creation in 2004 has always been a stronghold for the new patriotic party. Although the past few years has seen a sharp decline in votes for the party. While in 2016, the party was able to poll 60% of votes, it dropped to a stark 58.4% in the 2020 election, with the NDC gaining 40.6% in votes. While a new baseline survey has revealed more popularity for the NDC as compared 
to the MPP. However, it revealed that there'll be more preference for the MPP flag bearer, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, as compared to the NDC flag bearer, John Dramani Mahama. Well, we're right here in the Dom Kwamnya constituency. Will these findings reflect over here? Well, let's find out. I prefer Elik Blim Akulubu. This is Domi Kwabenya. And we can't see any development going on here. The road is bad. We don't have public toilets. We used to have, but they've constructed a state on the land where the toilet is. I was born here and bred here. My Kukwe senior came. At the time, he wanted power as an MP. He came, he promised a lot, but he d delivered nothing. You see, now the son also wanted to come. How? It's not a family kick. MPP party. Last year, I met my mom. I have regretted voting for the MPP. One KK is now five cities. Even three will not suffice. We have regretted. For my constituency, I will vote for the NDC parliamentary candidate. The others have used us. And I'm still crying. I look at To me, no. Yes, it's the same one. I have a at to Ama, and this is a umbra. We need change, and I'll vote for NDC to come. We can't even buy fruits. At first, we could buy mangoes for five to ten cities. But now, even 100 cities will not suffice. Even rubber is between 12 to 20 cities, and we can't buy. 12 cities, 15 cities, 20 Ghana, and to me, to I will vote for Kwame Bediaku because he's from my village and he knows how we are suffering. The others have come time and again, but there's no change. So I'll vote for someone who hasn't been president before. I'll also vote for Eli Krim. If anyone was like me, they would not vote for an MP. For the president, I will vote for MPP because it's my party. But for MPs, I won't. I just bought a shock absorber and it's already spoiled. I have seen what Mahama has done and what the current president has done. So if I compare the two, I will vote for NDC for both presidential and parliamentary. Parliamentary remember NDC. Well, you had the constituents of the Dom Kwamnya constituency for yourself. Well, it's left to be known what will really be the outcome of the 2024 general elections. Judith Brown. 3FM, Dom Kwabna constituency, Accra. And we're just some 23 days away for December 7th. We just wait to see how it will pan out. So join us again on every Wednesday and Friday for the all new segment on Hot Edition called Where to Watch. We bring you the consistency analysis, all the statistics, the profile of the aspirant, as well as voter patterns and why you need to watch out for that particular consistency. Away from that, flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia says, the comeback of the former president John Dramani Mahama will not yield anything fruitful and will rather set the country in a downward direction. Addressing party faithfuls at Adansia Sokwa in the Ashanti region, the flag bearer says under his presidency, women will get access to soft loans for business and he will also introduce other initiatives to continue the development of the country. We share a Every sector we have done better than him. We have created more jobs. We have built more roads. We have built more schools. We have built more airports. We have built more railways. We have built more hospitals. We have built more astrotechs. We have built more sports facilities. We have built more fish landing sites. We have built more courts. We have built more public libraries. We have built more sanitation facilities. We have done more Zongo development. Every sector, we have done more. And the other no person obey, obey to now kunyano, be kind to you, on train, in shishere bakuwa, odi ba ya, edi mfaso brega na for just one. Bakupi o, na the other na odi ba, aye, dumzo na person sandwa, aye, I confirm, 
ana eye good con kitty kitty Presidential candidates of the new patriotic party, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, there, as we've been telling you, we are just 23 days away from December 7. Stay with us, your election command center, before, during, and after the election for up to the minute detail and information on the December polls. But that will be all for our package for tonight's edition of Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. My name is Grace Hamwajiman. Stories that came through as headlines Electoral Commission meets Security Tax Force ahead of the December 7 polls. We took you live there to the meeting premises and gave you updates. Also tonight, violence attacks continue to break out in Boko in the Yapa East region with at least three more people killed in the suburb of Daduri this week. And Notong MP Samuel Kujeto Ablaka reject internal inquiry by Education Ministry into case of alleged distribution of expired rice to senior high schools as he demands an independent probe. Many thanks for joining us. Log on to trinews.com and get some more stories. Don't forget, in the next 30 minutes, Ghana is meeting Angola in that critical AFCON qualifiers. The sports team will be here to bring you updates as well as the live commentary. Good evening.